now more than ever, people need to go within and plug into that cellular memory, plug into divine source, detach as much as possible from the matrix. A lot of these people that have all these abilities, who have celestial star ancestry, they're operating not only throughout this cosmos, but in higher planes, and they're working against the Draco Empire. The photonic energy and the cosmic rays will activate our higher centers. And it's incumbent upon us to ride that frequency wave. Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you are listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, my very special guest is Gary David. Gary is an author and independent researcher who has studied southwestern archaeological ruins and rock art for over 25 years. His books about the Hopi and other ancestral pebble cultures of Arizona and Mexico include The Orion Zone, subtitled Ancient Star Cities of the American Southwest, Eyes of the Phoenix, Mysterious Visions and Secrets of the American Southwest, The Kivas of Heaven, subtitle Ancient Hopi Star Lore, and Star Shrines and Earthworks of the Desert Southwest. Uh, Gary David, how are you? I'm fine, James. Good to be here. I'm glad to have you on the show. Your subject matter and the research you do is of, of such compelling interest to me, and, uh, and I'm sure to many of, of our listeners on the Cosmic Switchboard Show, for the benefit of my listeners, could you tell them a bit about yourself and how you got involved in this work? Uh, yeah, I've I've lived here in Arizona um, uh, over 20 years, about 25 years, really. And um, I've been working with the Hopi people uh, and some of the other Pueblo uh, tribes in the, in the region. This is in uh, Arizona and um, northern Arizona, mo- mostly. I've been uh, going to Kachina dances and uh, interacting with the people up there, and um, you know it's a it's a fascinating culture that's still uh, doing the ceremonies up there on the, on three primary mesas that the, that the Hopi live on, and um, they they they're still doing their ancient ceremonies from over a thousand years ago, and it's, it's still being carried on in the tradition is still being carried on of these ancient people um you know they're they're people basically they're they were farmers and they still are they they grow corn beans and squash for the most part and they still do this dry farming use this dry farming method which which relies on natural irrigation instead of uh you know uh, uh, industrial irrigation you know they they just uh Basically, they use uh, the powers of the universe and their prayer in order to bring the rain to the high desert of Arizona. And um, it's it's just a fascinating uh, group of people that uh, are dedicated to to keeping the whole world in balance. That's their their basic um, goal of the culture itself is to do their ceremonies, and it's a whole cycle of ceremonies throughout the year that they perform. And um, they're, they're doing this basically to keep the whole world in balance. Um, the, the Hopi are called the people of peace, and they, they, they want to see peace in the world and balance. In fact, a lot of the Hopi uh, in the mid-20th century um, the Hopi elders went to the UN to try to to try to talk about you know, getting the world back into balance and and praying for peace. So, you know, these people are very dedicated. Uh, it's a hard life up there. You know, uh, some of the uh, some of the villages, uh, and there are about uh, twelve or thirteen villages up on these three spread across these three primary mesas. And they they lived in um, what what are called pueblos. They're kind of like stone apartment buildings, and um, they uh, they live in a very kind of a primitive way. Um, at least some of the villages still carry on this this tradition, and they don't have any running water or electricity to the villages. 
you can go up and visit these villages and talk to the people and participate, uh, at least witness some of the, some of the ceremonies that that go on up there. So it's it's a really fascinating uh, group of people that uh, have carried on this tradition, this mythological lore from the ancient past, and they they're still talking about. Uh, uh, some of their various mythologies, and we can we can get into some of the some of the legends that um, the Hopi people have about uh, coming to this continent and uh, and various other things. Yes, in your research, you discuss that they describe the they're coming to the third world in particular, or the fourth world. Correct me if I'm wrong, and they describe ascending or descending to this world uh, as a result of climbing or descending a large reed. And then in your research, you determine that in the Hopi language, the big reed corresponds to the Milky Way. So it seems as if their, co- their cosmology uh, and their lore suggest that they believe they, they come from beyond our planet. And in this case, the, the Orion constellation. Could, could you elaborate on that, Gary? Yeah, the, the, the Hopi have, an, have a, a legend about coming up from the Third World, which is a previous era uh, to this one. The Hopi, I should explain the, the, the different world eras because or, or um, time periods, because it's much like the Maya in uh, Central America uh, in uh, southern Mexico. Um, they have these uh, cycles of time that that uh, have been the people have lived in, and then the whole world was destroyed. And the Hopi are now living in the fourth world. They say we are all in this fourth world together, uh, but they've survived three uh, three different worlds previous to 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 this one. And the way they got up to this one, they've climbed up from the bottom of Grand Canyon to a great reed. That's the way they conceptualize it, is coming up through a a giant reed um, uh, at the bottom of Grand Canyon. And they climbed out of Grand Canyon, and they they climbed up out of the canyon and began to populate the Colorado Plateau, which in the Four Corners region of the United States. Um, but you know, as you said, the you know they they conceptualize this reed as as the Milky Way too, because the, the word Sangwuka, the Hopi word Sangwuka means big reed, and that's the word that refers to the Milky Way itself. So, um, a lot of the Hopi elders believe that their star ancestors led them up through this big reed to uh, to this planet. Does this correspond in any way to the story of the Hopi Sipapuni or the Hopi Sipapu? Yeah, that's that is uh, the Sipapu uh, is an actual physical structure. It's a natural geological structure, and it's located. You could find it on Google Earth. In fact, it's located on the north bank of the Little Colorado River, and it's a uh, what what is called a travertine dome. It's a limestone dome built up of mineral waters uh, through through many years, and and it's like um, it's about a hundred feet across, you know, and uh, uh, it's there's got a hole right in the center of it that the, uh, the that the water comes out of, and I hope they believe that they came up through this particular space. Uh, this 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 dome in at the bottom of Grand Canyon. Um, that's the way they, con- they that's the way they expressed it in their mythology. At any rate, um, you know, mythology is open to a lot of different interpretations, and you, you don't have to take these things uh, in a literal sense. And of course, I should stress to listeners that uh, the word myth has been abused by a lot of people and they think, well, it's an untruth. But in a lot of ancient cultures uh, used a mythology to explain their experience in the world, their historical experience in the world. So it's it's not something that should be discounted just because of the term uh, myth or mythology. But yeah, they came up out of this Sipapuni, came up out of the Grand Canyon and... Um, they they met with uh, the first thing that they met with 
is a god named Masao. Masao is a god of this earth plane, but he's also the god of the underworld. Uh, he's a god of fire. Um, he's a he's a very uh, kind of a spooky looking god. He has a large uh, bulbous head, uh, big round eyes, and a big round mouth. And the way we know this is uh, the Hopi make kachina dolls, the dolls that represent certain spirits or gods. And uh, we can see what this god looks like, and the and the god still is, hangs around today. In fact. Um, we can still what this, see what this god looks like by the Kachina dolls that that are made by the Hopi. They're carved by the Hopi. Um, but this god uh, had uh, you know very long arms, spindly arms, and uh, kind of a it, it was a tall a tall creature with uh, long feet and long hands. But and like I said, uh, um, large round eyes and a large round mouth. And uh, the skin of this god was gray. Uh, in fact, the the Hopi the Hopi word M A S or Mas, the root word of Masau, literally means gray. And if you look at the pictures, I have pictures in my books about this uh, describing this god uh, Masau, and he looks just like an extraterrestrial gray that that we can see above. I mean, it's it, you know it's very very close to to the the grays that we're familiar with from uh, from uh, recent literature and recent uh, recent images uh, on uh, television and the like. What's interesting is that the Depictions of Kachinas, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kachinas means roughly translated messenger or messengers. Some of these Kachina depictions and dolls, they, they seem to show beings with, and it varies from like a conical shaped head or like a cylindrical shaped head, a box shaped head. And one could infer perhaps that it could be a representation of a helmet or of a, a bulbous headed being of some kind. And I think it is suggestive that this Masao being is described as being gray and having like big round eyes. Yeah, exactly. The, you know, the Kachinas, um, uh, he technically is a god, but the Kachinas are, are spirit messengers, as you say. They're, um, they, they're kind of intercessors between the world of the gods and, and the world of the people, uh, between the, the, the plane of the sky beings and the plane of the earth people. Uh, these these Kachinas uh, come to the Hopi mesas. As I said, the, the Hopi live on three primary mesas in northern Arizona. And these Kachinas, um, they're, they're, they are spirits, but dances are held in the villages starting in about April uh, or even somewhat earlier, starting after the winter solstice. And they run through after the summer solstice. And the dances are held in the village plaza. And the uh, uh, people, pe the men, and uh, usually men, uh, it's the men that do the, the dancing, they put on these masks in order to become this actual kachina. In fact, their their um, their own ego or their own personhood is kind of abandoned when they put on this mask and they become this actual kachina spirit. And as you say, there are many different types of kachinas. Uh, the kachinas can represent any kind of uh, earth spirit or earth force, sky spirit. Um, and there are many. It's it's hard to describe them because it, it's so multifaceted. Uh, the, the kachina mask can be circular or dome shaped or cylindrical, or they can have horns and they can have feathers. And uh, some are like bug eyed, you know, or some have just slits for eyes. And as you say, the, there are some that look like helmets, you know, like uh, like helmets that would be worn by alien creatures so um these uh, these kachinas are different definitely from an alternate dimension and they come to the people the hopi people and they are always benevolent they're benevolent creatures 
that bring rainfall and bring good spirits to people. And the people are, are glad when the Kachinas come. The Kachina season, as I say, lasts from, you know, in the springtime when when the uh, the corn begins to grow. And, it, and through about July, July is the last Kachina dance that is held. And that's said that July is when the monsoon rains come to northern Arizona. The, the last Kachina dance is called the home dance. And that means that the Kachinas are going back home to wherever they originate. Uh, it might be up in the sky. Uh, the Hopi sometimes conceptualize the Kachinas living in the San Francisco Peaks, which is uh, about uh, 75 miles southwest of the Hopi Mesas. So, you know, it's it's a, a cyclical thing that Kachinas come during the agricultural season. They uh, help the burgeoning uh, corn grow and the beans and the squash, and they help things along agriculturally. And then they go after, you know, after the agriculture has a good hold on the mesas, and um, you know, then they harvest, of course, in in the in the fall. And there are different harvest dances as well. But these are non kachina dances with without the masks. So it, it's a whole ritual, uh, ceremonial cycle that that uh, is carried on by the Hopi people. That that is just fascinating. Now, were the Hopi descended from the Anasazi? What is the relationship? Between the two. Okay, the Anasazi is a term, basically it's a term that archaeologists began using in like the 1970s. Um, the, Anas, the word Anasazi is actually a Navajo word. The Navajo, of course, live in the, the American Southwest as well. In fact, the Navajo reservation surrounds the Hopi reservation. And sometimes the Navajo are thought of as the protectors of the Hopi. And yet at other times they're seen, they were seen throughout history as kind of uh, antagonistic to the Hopi. So uh, the Navajo came down from the north. Uh, after uh, 1300 AD, you know, the, the Navajo are not indigenous to, to the southwest. And they came down. The Navajo, they're not agrarian like the Hopi. They're not farmers like the Hopi. They, were, they basically were sheep herders. Uh, the word Anasazi it means ancient enemy. So back in the time where the, when the Navajo first migrated into the southwest, the, um, the, the Navajo and the Hopi were, had, uh, had skirmishes and, and kind of warfare between the two. So the Navajo term Anasazi means ancient enemies, which refers to the Hopi. The Hopi use a term... Uh, called Hizatsinom. Hizatsinom is uh, literally means like ancient people. That's the way they refer to their ancestors instead of using the term Anasazi. Uh, archaeologists today have kind of created a, a catch-all term, uh, ancient Puebloans, they call them, because there, there are many different Pueblo groups, that those people that live in those stone apartment buildings. There are different types of Pueblo groups, uh, the Zuni and the Acoma and the Laguna, and there are a whole bunch of different uh, Pueblo people that grew up along the Rio Grande River in New Mexico. So uh, the, the, the archaeologists call the, these people in general as ancestral Puebloans. You know, it's pretty interesting that these people, uh, these ancient people, have this connection to the living Hopi. You know, the Hopi recite the legends of these ancient peoples, especially during the winter time. They go down into their kivas or their underground prayer chambers and tell these stories, uh, these legends of, you know, coming up through the Sipapuni from the third world into the fourth world and the various legends that, that go along with, with the god Masau. And, uh, you know, it's, um, they, they carry on this tradition even today. And for the benefit of our listeners, when the Hopi refer to the four worlds, they're referring to previous civilizations which 
ultimately ended in some kind of a cataclysm or a catastrophe. Could, could you go into that? The Hopi believed that the, the uh, different worlds were destroyed. Three different previous worlds were destroyed. The first world, they say, was destroyed by fire, the element of fire. Now, this could be interpreted as perhaps some kind of comet impact or a coronal mass ejection from the sun. Some sort of fire hit the earth and destroyed this first world. The first world was like a paradise. It was um, a world in which um, the, the humans and the animals understood each other and could talk to each other. They were you know, one with nature. It was almost like an Eden. It was a paradise. And, um, but gen generally, as, as it uh, always happens, the humans uh, began to be corrupt. And, you know, this happens... Of, as we see even today, you know, the, the, you know, humans become corrupt. The society c becomes corrupt. And there are social misdeeds and uh, things that are, go against the ways of the creator. And this happened to the first world. So the creator decided to destroy the first world by sending this fire upon the earth and like i say it could be a comet that you know the comet that hit hit the earth um you know 12,000 years ago or 13,000 years ago uh and it hit north america there was a huge comet that hit uh hit uh, around canada and, and so forth and, and really destroyed uh, the northern part of the uh, north america and into the southern part um, so, you know, it, uh, it was a destruction of this particular world that the Hopi sought refuge in underground caves and caverns. And they were led to these caverns by what they call the ant people uh, or the Anisinom. Uh, the ant people um, are, you know, like half human, half insect and they have uh, thin thin legs and arms and like bulbous heads and they have antenna and large eyes you know i've seen these ant people depicted in the rock art carved in the cliff walls of uh, northern arizona these ant people you know help the people survive in these caverns while the destruction of the first world was going on they helped them survive by you know showing them how to sprout beans for instance in the in the caverns and the hopi today have this ceremony it takes place in february it's called the powamu ceremony and uh, they sprout beans in the kiva which is an underground prayer chamber it's sort of like the caverns that they they sought refuge in the ant people showed them how to sprout beans and survive in, in these caves. When it was safe to come out, they came out into the second world. Now, the second world was not quite as, as, uh, as uh, like a paradise that you would think of, of the first world. They, you know, the, the people, um, they, they lived uh, and they, they carried on various trade between groups um, it was still fairly peaceful in the second world but again this this trait this human trait of corruption and and societal discord took over and corrupted the people and the people were doing things against the ways of the creator various sorts of sexual deviations and so forth the creator decided to destroy the the second world and the second world was destroyed by ice, the element of ice. Some believe that this was actually a pole shift, and the ice age uh, took over uh, during this period. And again, the Hopi people survived by going into these caverns, into these underground caves. And the ant people showed them again how to survive in these caves until it was safe to come out, until the ice had receded. And then uh, the Hopi came up into the third world. 
And the third world was was an interesting place because um, the the third world began uh, rather primitively, but developed a civilization in which there were uh, you know cities basically all over the world. And we think of Lemuria, we think of Atlantis, these kinds of places that developed during this time. And there were um, airships that flew all over the globe. The Hopi have a term for these. Um, they call them flying shields, or paatu vota is, is the term that they use. These flying shields that they could fly up into the sky with. And uh, we also think of the, uh, the Hindu vimanas, the, these airships that the, the ancient Hindu texts, the Ramayana and so forth, talk about. These are right in line with the way the Hopi conceptualize this third world place. And again, um, the, the society, the civilization began, began to be corrupt. And the, the creator decided to, to destroy the, the third world. Uh, and the third world was destroyed by a great flood. Uh, a great deluge uh, came across the earth. And of course, you know, this is a universal uh, mythology. Uh, cultures all over the world have flood myths. And the Hopi survived this time, not by the ant people, but they simply built rafts, reed rafts, uh, rafts of bamboo, and they floated across the Pacific Ocean from Lemuria, to the western coast of North America. And this is how, how they c came to this continent. So there are these three worlds that were destroyed, uh, and now we're living in the, in the fourth world. And many, many elders believe that we're at the end of the fourth world right now. We typically think of the Hopi and, in general, the Native Americans of the Southwest as being essentially landlocked people. But mm -hmm. it turns out that they probably came from across the Pacific. And what's also interesting, Gary, is, is all the correspondences between the Hopi culture and, well, you mentioned earlier Lemuria, uh, the South Pacific. There's even a Hindu connection, which perhaps suggests that there was – a, a global civilization where there was a there may have been a lingua franca. Your book is called the Orion Zone, and your website is called the OrionZone dot com. What is particularly fascinating to me is the parallels between your research and your findings in the desert Southwest and people such as Adrian Gilbert and uh, Robert Baval with their findings that the for example the Giza pyramid complex is in alignment with, with the Orion constellation belt. It turns out that that is a commonality with the Hopi people. And, and I believe you mentioned that this creator god of theirs, Masao, may have had something to do with the, where the location of these Hopi settlements were set up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I'll tell you how I came across this, this theory that set me on this, this uh, journey, really, it was 1997, and I had just read Robert Bouval and Adrian Gilbert's book, The Orion Mystery. And, of course, you know, it, he talks about the, the belt stars of Orion corresponding to the three pier, major pyramids on the Giza Plateau. And uh, this, was, this was all very interesting uh, to me uh, to, see, to see that a culture would be, uh, an ancient culture like that, would be so interested in in the sky and in in the ancient uh, in, you know, archaeo astronomy as they as they call it, um, I was I was going up to a Kachina dance in northern Arizona. I was driving from the south up to the Hopi mesas and looking at the mesas in the distance. These three primary mesas. And you know you can you can start to daydream a lot when you're driving across the desert. I don't know if you've ever been driving in the Southwest, James, but uh, you know the 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 vistas just kind of telescope out, and you can see you can basically see forever across the desert uh, landscape. And I was I was going up to these uh, these three mesas, 
And, you know, it, the thought occurred to me, well, there are three mesas that the Hopi live on, and they've lived on these mesas at least since 1000 A.D., if not earlier. And, you know, maybe there's an Orion correlation right here in Arizona, you know. And I thought, well, that's that's an interesting thought. So, you know, I kind of put it at the back of my mind I thought, well, you know, that's something to think about. And I went up to observe one of these Kachina dances in the village plaza. And uh, then when I got home, I took out a map of Arizona and took out a, a star chart and compared the two of them. And I found that there was a a ruined site, an abandoned ru- ruined site, or a village that is currently being being inhabited, uh, corresponding to every major star in the constellation Orion, and th- this was just uncanny. There was a a one to one correspondence between every star, not just the belt stars, but every star in the constellation Orion. And this kind of set me off on this journey to to write my first book, The Orion Zone. And, of course, I went to all these sites, uh, many different sites, Pueblo sites. Some are national monuments right now. Some are state parks. These ancient ruins that are abandoned, that were abandoned, uh, you know, centuries ago by the Hopi. But uh, the the Hopi still have an active uh, relationship with these abandoned villages because the the spirits are still there in these villages, they they still inhabit uh, inhabit the place uh, so many said that they were so many centuries ago. You know this this started me on this this kind of quest to uh, try to verify this this relationship that the Hopi have with the constellation Orion, and it is uh, it is a real thing that you know Orion they call the belt stars of Orion Hotamkam which means beads on a string. It refers to the belt stars themselves. The, the Hopi uh, used the constellation Orion as to synchronize one of their most important ceremonies. As I say, the, the ceremonies, some of the ceremonies are held down in the kivas. There are these, these prayer chambers that they descend to a, a ladder in the roof of the, of the chamber. And they go down in there, and there's a hatchway overhead that you can look through and see the sky. And during the winter solstice ceremony, it starts in the middle of the night, not not at sunrise, as you, you might think, but it starts in the middle of the night. And the way they start the ceremony, they see the constellation Orion overhead in this hatchway. And that's the beginning of the particular ceremony that um that they perform uh until the dawn when the sun rises the the farthest south on the horizon and and the hopi kept track of where the sun rose of course every throughout the season so they could build their agricultural calendar so you know the you know the hopi used this constellation of orion as a kind of a a synchronization of their particular ceremony. One of the most spectacular sights I've ever seen, Gary, was I was driving up <coughs> Highway 93, uh, going north on Highway 93 from Arizona up towards Las Vegas. Oh. And, or yeah, it was around that area, and just above the horizon at night was... Orion, the whole constellation in, in all its glory. No, take it back. I, I was actually on Highway 40 passing needles. That's mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. It was flatter. And then uh, right above, because I was headed for Las Vegas, the horizon was Orion. It was a breathtaking spectacle. N- another thing that was always of interest to me also is you mentioned in, in your findings that there seems to be a correlation with with the solstices where a lot of these ancient sites in alignment with uh, the Orion constellation are, are at, if one goes to uh, certain places at certain times of the year, typically the solstices, there may be like a sunrise or a sunset that they may see. Could, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, the, the Hopi have uh, what are called sun, sun watchers. Uh, the word is Tawamungwe, or sun chiefs. 
And uh, these were were actual uh, jobs that these uh, particular men did. They that, that correlated, you know, the way that the sun rose on the horizon to a particular time. And they would know when uh, the sun rose over a particular mesa because they they'd start out from a sun watching place, a, a place that they observed from, and this. This was the same place every year because the Hopi, of course, are you know um, lived in one place. They were farmers, so they didn't move around. They weren't nomadic like some of the tribes, but they stayed in the same place of all year round. So the sun watchers could observe the eastern horizon, especially, um, and to see where the sun rose at each particular time of the year. And they they needed to know this. They needed to know, for instance, when the the summer solstice was and when the winter solstice was because the sun rose the farthest north and south along the horizon. And uh, they needed to know this for for agricultural reasons, when to plant a a, a specific type of corn, for instance, when to uh, gather the eagles for for ceremonies uh, during the summer. They gathered the eagles in March and they would know when you know when this was when the sun was equidistant between uh, the the northern house or the summer's house and the southern house where where the sun lived in these two houses a north and south uh, furthest north and furthest south along the horizon you know it's a very complicated thing that the uh, that the hopi had going and they they could pretty accurately tell what time of year it was by where the sun rose because you can see along the horizon as you as you know James that uh, you can see little buttes and mesas and so forth and you can mark them and if you're in a single place during during the year you can see where the sun is rising over a particular uh, spot on the horizon uh, you know I used to do this from my from my back deck in northern Arizona I could see you know Orion rising in the east, and and uh, you know Orion would uh, w- would rise at a certain uh, place. Uh, you know uh, during the year it it came uh, uh, it first appeared during uh, July um, in in the early hours of July before the sun rose, and you can you could tell uh, you know where um, and the sun was rising. At that time, it started to go south, you know, because it was after the summer solstice. So, uh, it's uh, it's a very um, a very um, a complicated system that the Hopi used. The, they uh, they they also carved cliffs in, with uh, particular spirals. Okay, that marked. Uh, that marked where uh, the um, certain uh, little blades of light would come into the spiral at the summer solstice. Uh, for instance, at uh, a place in Chaco Canyon, which is in New Mexico, the ancient Hopi, the ancestral Hopi, carved they carved a spiral in the cliff face on uh, what is called Fajada Butte. Um, and during the, um, the summer solstice, a little sliver of light bisects this spiral exactly on the summer solstice uh, there's, huh. there's and um also the winter solstice there are very various ways that they they made marks in the rock face to designate the winter solstice and also the, the uh, both equinoxes the vernal and autumnal equinoxes they they marked on this on this diagram on the cliff on the cliff wall that uh, it's very very exact, and in the Chaco Canyon, which has uh, many different uh, huge buildings, in the, one of the largest sites in the American Southwest, some of the buildings themselves were oriented towards the summer solstice, sunrise, and sunset, and also uh, there were lunar alignments with the. Um, the, the moon rises, of course, uh, at different parts of the horizon, and there uh, sometimes it rises uh, further north and further south along the horizon. And this is an 18.6 year cycle that this moon goes through, rising at, at different places on the horizon. And some of these buildings were even aligned to this 
very complex 18.6 year cycle. These are masters in sky watching. They they knew where they were in the in the uh, season, uh, in the in the cycle of the year. They could tell exactly where they where they were. They they had a, a definite calendar uh, created by the stars. You mentioned earlier uh, the the ant people, and you mentioned some of the kachinas and various kachinas, and how some of them resembled perhaps even aliens or like bug-like creatures. It's interesting the correspondence with modern-day alien abduction literature. There's the insectoids, there's the mantis beings, some of the gray beings can be described as looking somewhat bug-like. Another interesting correspondence is there seems to have been a another god, if you will, not Masao, but another one that had almost a Quetzalcoatl aspect or nature to him. Uh, would you like to talk about that? Well, I think you might be referring to the sky god. There was a sky god that um, that the Hopi uh, worshipped, and uh, the the name of the sky god was Totukn. And if you look at it, pictures of Kachina, the uh, Kachina dolls, um, he he has a kind of a helmet like I talked about before. I mean, with slit eyes and and uh, uh, kind of a helmet, a white helmet that that he wears. Okay, and um, he he definitely came from from the sky, from the celestial realm, and the Hopi have certain uh, certain legends about this sky god. Uh, for instance, um, there's a legend that, that that happened that there was a great flood. I, I mentioned that before. There was a great flood, and uh, this flood was engulfing a, a particular village. And everybody was running around kind of chaotically, and they were trying to flee this great flood that was uh, going for the village and coming, you know, about to engulf the village. And um, two two twins, a, a brother and a sister, were kind of left behind in in the in the melee. They were left behind, uh, and everybody fled, and they were kind of left there. Uh, and, but they had to go out and try to find where their parents had gone to. So they went out into the desert, and and uh, the first night they they camped, and they saw a light on the horizon, and the light got bigger and bigger and bigger, and finally the light came down to earth. Out of this light, uh, this creature came out of the uh, out of the light uh, out of the craft that he had descended on and like i said he he had uh, kind of a helmet on and a sparkly uh, sparkly costume and he was wearing clothing that sparkled all over it's it's said that the the face that in the in the myth it says that the face shone like a star and the the costume was glittered like icicles. Now, to a culture that had never seen metal or metallic substances before, you know, icicles would be the closest thing to a metallic substances that they could relate to. You know, so the costume, the, the clothing that this creature wore was uh, glittered like icicles. And this creature said, uh, you know, told the children, don't be afraid. I'm, I'm a, a benevolent. I'm a good, good creature that that's here to help you find your parents. And the creature took them up into this craft, and they went high above the earth into this flying shield, like I mentioned before, this patu vota. And the, the, they uh, they hovered over the earth, and the creature fed them, you know, melons and and uh, corn and, and so forth, and and the. Uh, and then uh, they, they hovered over the place where the parents had fled to, and then the, the the craft sat down on the desert, and the children left this craft and um, to, to go find their parents. But the, but the creature, this Sotuknang, said before they left, he said, "Don't worry, I'll I'll come to you again in your dreams to to show you the the right way to live." Okay, the, the the proper uh, proper way to live. So the children, you know, went off and uh, were reunited with the parents. So this is a, you know a, a 
legend about this star being, this star ancestor or whatever you want to call him, uh, helping this these two uh, Hopi children uh, find find their parents again. So, and you know the Hopi have a lot of different legends about these craft um, coming down. Um, uh, some craft come down and um, the, the star Kachina comes out and and takes a Hopi bride and mates with with Hopi women. So, you know there might be star star blood in in the Hopi Hopi people's genetics. You know the 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 Hopi have this, these legends of of these people coming down from the sky, and you know mating with with uh, Hopi women. These these star kachinas. That parallels so many other accounts, uh, i.e. the Nephilim exactly. beholding the women of Earth being fair and came down and mated with them, etc. Mm-hmm. There are so many correspondences. For example, the the rock carvings over there, which show what some would regard as like a mantis being. And you, you, there's another story which I, I thought was very interesting too in, in the Hopi lore. Uh, in terms of uh, a translation, a uh, linguistic translation, one of these star beings has a kind of a Sumerian connection where the translation is almost Anu as a first name and Naki as another. Could you elaborate on that, Gary? Yeah, the the the, the Hopi word we we talked about these these ant people before. I talked about the, them and how they they helped the people survive, and they were you know ba- basically benevolent people that helped the Hopi survive these two different world cataclysms, um, the, the tr- destruction of the first world and then the destruction of the second world, and um, uh, the Hopi word for ant is Anu. And a Hopi word for friend is Naki. So you put those two together, the Anunnaki, <laughs> you know, the the sons of the God who made it with the daughters of men, you know, to produce these giants in the earth. And the Hopi also have have these Kachinas who who actually are giants, you know. Uh, and um, I've I've seen some of these Kachina dances where they portray these these giant like creatures. And I was at this one Kachina dance and. Um, uh, this this one kachina came out and the mask was just terrifying. It had bug eyes, and you know hair just kind of you know going all different ways, sticking up, and you know feathers sticking out of its head, and you know it, it had a mask of course on. It was very frightening. And this kachina had a, a butcher knife about a foot long, you know, and he walked right by me, and I kind of kind of backed up because you know I didn't know what was going to. Uh, come of this, you know. I mean, these kachinas, these giant kachinas that the Hopi talk about, you know, they um, they talk about these legends of giants coming in, and sometimes if the kids are misbehaving or you know not not being uh, not acting like good Hopi children, uh, these giants will abduct abduct them and you know cannibalize them. So. <laughs> There's a way to to keep the Hopi kids in line, I guess. You don't want to be abducted by these these giant giant creatures. But you know the the, the Hopi uh, have these legends of giants, and also you know these ant people, the the Anunnaki, uh, the Anu Anusinom, the, which literally means ant people. So uh, you know this is the way <laughs> this is the way they. they uh, Educate the children, I guess, and and keep them on the straight and narrow. There are many other Native American uh, tribes that have similar stories embedded in their lore about giants and about how the giants were very real, and that had, at one time the people in the various regions were in great fear of the of the giants. So it, it's interesting that this also should come up in the uh, the Hopi lore. Uh, in the time we have left in the first hour, Gary, uh, another thing that's uh, of interest is, again, the correspondences we referred to earlier. Uh, some of the symbolism seems to uh, be related to symbolism found elsewhere around the world, such as uh, the the Sanskrit Om symbol, the the swastika, mm-hmm. the Maltese cross. Uh, you know, you can take it, you know, bits and pieces, and you can uh, finish up on this thought in the next hour. But c- can you talk a bit about some of these common symbols that seem to be showing up the Hopi culture. Sure, yeah. For instance, the swastika is is not 
not a uh, symbol of, merely of the Third Reich uh, that we, we think of, but it's, a, it's an ancient uh, Native American symbol that's used. That the Navajo have the same symbol of the swastika, and the swastika is uh, symbolic of basically the four directions. Um, and the Hopi in their migrations after they came up out of the earth uh, from the third world to the fourth, they had to go on these migrations uh, to the four different directions. And the the, um, the swastika is the way they symbolize these four directions that they migrated to. And uh, even today they have the, the symbol on, on the dance rattles that you see uh, in the on, in the Kachina dances, they have this this symbol, the swastika symbol, on um, on these dance rattles that they use. But you know there there is a lot of carryover between the old world and the new. Um, we can talk about this maybe in the next hour um, about um, Kincaid's cave and the artifacts that they found supposedly found in the Grand Canyon. Um, different Egyptian and, and uh, Near Eastern artifacts that that, um, that they found, but you know there's there is a lot of a uh, lot of um, symbolism between between the two cultures, the Native American culture and uh, the Near East, for instance. Um, you know that are the same, and um, you know we can we can talk about this a little more uh, as we go along. Um, yeah, what, one of the things that, you know, while we still have time in the first hour, the origin of the Hopi snake clan, uh, there seems to be a, a correlation or a connection to the Indus Valley civilizations and, and the stories of the Nagas, uh, the serpent worship that came from the subcontinent. Uh, do, do you want to talk about that? Sure, yeah. The, the Nagas, uh, as you say, came from the Indus River Valley in India. But they were global civilization, and they sailed basically all over the world. And they sailed from India uh, to the east into the Pacific. And I, I think that's probably where the Hopi came into contact with them, because, as I said before, the Hopi were, uh, you know, were in the Pacific region. And uh, my books, uh, you know, detail some some evidence that you know, it is not not just the myths, but you know, I have some gen genetic evidence that. That um, that kind of uh, points to the fact that the Hopi actually were uh, they were in Polynesia and these places, um, and then they came eastward. They sailed eastward across the Pacific uh, to the North American continent. But I think you know the Hopi probably uh, were in contact with the Nagas in the Western Pacific region and in the in the Southern Pacific area. And um, they took their their knowledge of of the snake the snake people uh, into North America. Um, and, and in fact, my book I'm working on a book now called The Journey of the Serpent People. And this talks uh, this will talk about the, the the way the Hopi migrated from this area. And uh, there there is a, a particular legend. That, that talks about a, a young boy named Tio, which literally means boy in Hopi, and he he visited the island of the Serpent People. He uh, you know uh, went down the Colorado River. You know they were already established in Arizona, in northern Arizona, and he was wondering where this river was flowing, the Colorado River, which flows south into the the, the Baja region of, of California. And he went down this this river in a uh, a sealed log, okay. And he sailed out into the Pacific Ocean, and he went to uh, this island of the Serpent People. Uh, he was uh, assisted by uh, a figure named Spider Grandmother, which uh, plays a large part in uh, in Hopi lore as well. But uh, he went to this island of the Snake People, and uh, he watched. You know the these people turn into to snakes. They you know they he went down into their snake kiva he called it, and uh, you know these people you know, actually turned into serpents and began to do ceremonies. Uh, and um, the the serpent people taught this young boy Tio how to do the snake dance. 
Okay, and so, you know, he, he learned how to do this ceremony, and he took it back to Arizona with him. He, took, he also took a, a snake bride with him, took her to Arizona, and, you know, he began doing the, the snake dance, and the, the snake dance is still performed every other year in August uh, on the Hopi Mesas. Uh, and um, it's it's a way to again bring rain to this very arid place. Uh, the snakes are known all over the world for symbolizing water and fertility. So you know he started doing these snake dances to help the help the the rainfall come. So you know he got th- this information from somewhere in the Pacific. So this snake island somewhere in the Pacific. It was an island, uh, the island of the Nagas, you know, that he he came across. So um, th- this is um, this is the link that the Hopi still celebrate between you know these Naga people, these serpent people, and uh, you know what they do today on the on the Hopi mesas. Fascinating story. Well, we've reached the end of the first hour. My very special guest is Gary David, theorionzone.com, and he's written a book called The Orion Zone, and definitely would want to hear more about the, the serpent people. Please go to our website and sign up and become a member, and we will see you at the top of the next hour.